Hi, my name is Dr. Josh Cohen. I'm a cataract surgeon at Cohen Laser Vision Center in Boca Raton, Florida. Today, I want to get an overview about the different types of cataract surgery lens options available, or IOLs, so that you can just have a general understanding of what to expect when you get cataract surgery and what your options actually are. And it can be a little overwhelming and sometimes confusing knowing exactly what type of lens might be appropriate for you and what your visual expectations might be. So I hope today to clarify some of those concerns. Now, the history of intraocular lenses is pretty fascinating. A British ophthalmologist, Sir Nicholas Harold Ridley, in the 1940s, when he examined fighter pilots who were injured in battle, noticed that the PMMA or acrylic material that the housing of the cockpit was in, um, sometimes little fragments would flake off and get in embedded into the eye. And he noticed that there was not an inflammatory response to this material, which is very unusual. Most of the time, as you may know, the body doesn't like things that are not of itself. So if there's any contaminant, whether it's an infection or a foreign body, the body sends an immune response to fight that. And that's called a granulomatous reaction or inflammatory reaction. And that can present in a variety of different ways, depending on the type of organ or tissue that the inflammation results. Now, the eye is a very immune protected organ. Uh, the immune response can be quite fascinating and quite robust. So this observation was quite keen and he developed with a, a company called Rayner, which still makes lenses today, the first PMMA lens, which is a type of acrylic lens. It's basically plexiglass, but it was branded under a different name. As a proof of concept, the first intraocular implant was implanted in 1949 and the first in the US was implanted at Will's Eye Hospital in 1952. Now, over the last 70 years, there's been a lot of developments in this. Uh, in this industry. And the optics and refinement and principles of intraocular lenses have come a long way. But nonetheless, there are basically four broad categories that you should know about, and we'll talk about each of those right now. So the first type of intraocular lens is called a monofocal lens, and that basically looks like this. Basically, it is a central optic zone, about six millimeters on average, and it only has one focal length, meaning it can only be targeted for distance or near. Now, when we do measurements on the eye, we measure the thickness of the cornea, the curvature of the cornea, the length of the eye, the depth between the cornea and the iris, the thickness of the lens. There's a lot of parameters that go into formulas that we as ophthalmologists use to kind of estimate the right size and diopter power in the lens. And the diopter power of the lenses is very different than your glasses power. And that's because the optics of the lens inside the eye are different than optics outside outside the eye, topic for a different day. But nonetheless, if you happen to look at your chart or if you get a card after cataract surgery, you notice that, oh, I have a 20.5 diopter lens, but I was only, you know, a minus one. That doesn't make any sense. Don't worry about that. Basically, that's our job to kind of reconcile those differences. But the formulas that we use are designed to target this type of lens, usually for distance, what we call optical infinity, to get you driving, seeing, you know, TV, movies, all that everything distance in focus, because that's really what we use day to day when we're walking around. But they do not provide any sort of reading. So if you opt with a basic lens, which is a monofocal lens, then you're really going to see good distance, but you'll definitely need reading glasses. And these lenses come from a variety of different manufacturers. They're made by Alcon, J&J, &J, Bosch & Lam, Rayner. Almost every manufacturer produces a monofocal lens, and they all are quite good. And the outcomes are all excellent pretty much no matter which lens you choose. Now there are different subtleties between them and that's for your doctor to kind of determine what might be best based on your personal anatomy, uh, whether you had previous surgery, for example, or if your cornea might be a little irregular. But nonetheless, these are great bread and butter options and the by far the majority of the lenses that I implant today. Additionally, there's no correction for astigmatism. We talk about that in some other videos and I will link over here if you want to reference what astigmatism is and how we treat it, not just with cataract surgery, but through other modalities. But astigmatism is a asymmetric curvature of the cornea or lens. But if you've been diagnosed with one, or if one presents itself during your measurements, you may opt for an astigmatism correcting lens, which basically looks about the same, but there are a few key differences. Number one is there's usually some sort of alignment marker here and here. And that allows us as surgeons to basically orient the lens and twist it once it's inside the eye into the right axis. This requires some additional markings, either with a femtosecond laser or done by hand. But this allows us to make sure that the orientation of the lens is just right because it does need to be placed exactly right or else it won't be effective. So that will give you even sharper distance vision if necessary. And I say if necessary because an astigmatism correcting lens is really only required if you, one, don't want glasses, and two, if your eyes present as having corneal astigmatism. The reason why astigmatism 
in cataract surgery is different than astigmatism in your glasses prescription is because the astigmatism that you wear currently in your glasses or contacts accounts for the whole natural eye, both the cornea and the lens. When we do cataract surgery, we take out the lens, so we're eliminating one of those components, so the residual astigmatism might be different. So that's why a toric lens or an astigmatic correcting lens is another great option. These lenses are principally monofocal as well. So if you get a toric lens, you're still going to be getting distance vision only, but it'll probably be a little sharper than a classic or basic monofocal lens like I mentioned previously. The next type of lens is an interesting intermediate style lens, and that's called an extended depth of focus lens, or EDOF for short. An EDOF lens is basically a monofocal lens with a little bit of um, optical properties that give some intermediate and reading distance as well. So it really is a focusing lens for distance, but it does give a little bit of intermediate. So it's really great for people who are like tennis players, for example, who really prioritize binocular distance acuity, want nice clear vision, but want that graduated depth, but really don't mind needing reading glasses for super small text or for things really close to your face. So an EDUF lens, some options that are available now is there's a new one called the Rayner EMV. Which there's also the Alcon Vividi lens. There's also the Johnson & Johnson Symphony lens and the Symphony OptiBlue is the new version of that. And there is even the Johnson & Johnson Eye Hands, which is kind of a uh, monofocal plus. It doesn't quite give as much reading as the Symphony or Vividi do, but it gives a little bit in between. So basically in the EDUF spectrum, these are nice options because sometimes they can be um, the same price as a basic lens or even covered by insurance. But the, for the ones that provide a little more reading, like the Vividi and the Symphony, those are not branded in the U.S. as monofocal lenses. They're called premium or enhanced lenses, and therefore they often come with an additional cost. The EDUFs often work on a principle called spherical aberration, um, and they uh, almost have, for lack of a better term, a little bulge, almost like a little nipple in the middle of the optical zone. Um, some have different designs, but that general pattern allows for a, um, you know, a slight augmentation and a slight additional focal length that gives that intermediate vision, uh, which is a really cool um, you know, optical phenomenon. Now, the last type of lens that I'll talk about today is called a multifocal lens. And these used to be bifocal lenses in the mid uh, teens, and now they've really all been converted to uh, pretty much a trifocal or a multifocal lens, which gives you distance vision, intermediate vision, and up close vision. And those focal points range between about 14 to 16 inches up close, about 22 to 24 inches in that mid range, and then all the way down, you know, to infinity for far away vision. So these lenses often kind of look like this. They, they kind of have a little bit of that, that ring pattern inside. And each of those little ring segments, which are called echelettes, each of those ring segments through a principle of called diffractive optics basically gives a variety of focus distances. And this is a natural process. It's not like bifocal or progressive lenses where you have to position your eye up or down like you would in glasses, no matter where you're looking, the brain will recognize that there is one image in focus. Now, through diffractive optics, that principle requires light being basically blocked or scattered when it's not being in focus. So these don't perform as well in low light conditions. And that could mean that if you're reading menus at a restaurant, even though you might be able to see clearly, you might need more light to get that true benefit. And also because of the rings themselves, some people notice some glare and halos at night when you're driving. So those ring artifacts can sometimes be bothersome for patients, usually not enough where they want them removed, but it is something to be aware of. I'd say about five to 10% complain of those visual phenomena. Um, they usually also tend to improve with time as your brain gets used to these optical properties. Now, some brands of the multifocal uh, variety would be the Alcon Panoptics uh, and the Panoptics Clairon, which is the new version of that, and the J&J Synergy lens. Both of these are the commercially available multifocals. There are others that will come to market, no doubt, within the next couple of years, but these are excellent predictable lenses that give good distance, intermediate, and near vision. Now, in my experience, I found that the EDUF lenses and the multifocal lenses, those are two premium category lenses. Those are not covered by insurance, and they do come um, at quite a significant upgrade cost to standard cataract surgery, but they are kind of the best options if you really don't want to wear glasses after surgery. If you do want to, if you don't mind wearing glasses, then I usually don't recommend these lenses because of those other visual phenomena that I mentioned, in addition to the cost. Now, lately, what's also been done more and more, and even in our practice, is we might mix and match. We might do an extended of the focus in one eye, let's say your dominant eye, but because that eye has great distance, minimal glare, but not quite as much reading, 
the other eye might get a multifocal. That'll still give good distance. I often find the multifocals may not be quite as crisp as a monofocal or an EDOF lens for distance, but they provide excellent reading. So for patients who are attorneys or, or people who kind of are on the computer or on their desk work all the time, getting that nice, close, crispy reading vision is really, in my opinion, only achieved with multifocal lenses that do have these rings. Now, there are other types of lenses, like an older crystalline lens, which actually has a vaulting mechanism that kind of moves the lens up and down, similar to the natural lens in terms of when we talked about the flexibility of the ciliary body, and that process is called accommodation. When we lose that as we age, that's called presbyopia. I have a video on that if you want to learn more about that. But those lenses uh, we don't use quite as much because the flexibility does seem to kind of uh, fade with time, so they don't provide the same type of reading that these fixed lenses do. Now, one fifth category of lens is called a light adjustable lens. Now, this is a little bit different because it kind of falls into that EDUF category, so it's still technically in that third group. But the difference between this lens is that this manufactured lens by RX Sight has the special properties that the materials within the lens are not a fixed plastic. They're a special like elastomer type material that with focused ultraviolet light can actually change its shape. So after surgery, if you happen to be a little off in your calculations or estimates, you can touch that up after. So let's say you're a little nearsighted or farsighted, or maybe there's a little more astigmatism left over than you anticipated. Well, the LAL will theoretically treat that. And those provide amazing outcomes because of that. But they do require some behavioral modification. You can't be exposed to natural UV light and you have to sit for additional treatments after surgery, sometimes two to three different treatments a few weeks apart to make sure that we can kind of tailor that in. This is a new technology lens. It's not available everywhere. We don't yet offer it here at Cone Laser Vision Center, but it is another option if you're curious for your best possible outcomes. LAL or light adjustable lens is really great. Now, for patients who've had previous refractive surgery like LASIK or RK, um, or smile, then sometimes the light adjustable lens might be a really good idea because of that additional flexibility afterwards. As I mentioned, when we plan on calculations, formulas that we use will give us an estimated outcome based on the lens that we choose, but sometimes those formulas begin to break down if you've had previous surgery. Now we have modifications, we have ways to adjust for that, and that's what we do all the time, and we still get great outcomes, but nonetheless, it doesn't always work out 100% of the time, so LAL gives a little bit of a buffer. For corneas particularly irregular, or if we're not confident the measurements are consistent, then LAL might be a really good option. So what are, what are all these lenses made out of? Well, they're all basically made out of some sort of inert plastic or silicone, so usually an acrylic or PMMA, which is basically like a type of plexiglass, basically. Um, but these are generally quite flexible. Those are the most common material types, but they're all inert, they're all safe, so don't, don't worry about that. Now, the design of all these lenses is a little bit different in terms of their overall structure. They all share the same general elements, which is a large central optical zone and then some sort of support structure. Here we see two of these flanges that are called haptics, um, but you can see them as you can see here. They, they have sometimes different shapes and designs. None of that really matters. It just, you know, from a surgeon's perspective, sometimes our, our technique might alter, but nonetheless, they all are supported and they're all designed to be centered within the capsular bag or the support structure within the eye. If I were advising you as to which lens you might want to consider, the first question I have is, do you mind wearing glasses? Yes or no. If you don't mind wearing glasses, then go with the basic lens. It's covered by insurance. It's going to be your most economical option. And the optical clarity of the monofocals is excellent. They have the widest sweet spot, if you will, and minimal glare. So for patients who don't mind wearing glasses with an intraocular lens of a basic monofocal, their outcomes are usually quite exceptional um, and predictable. So that's kind of the, the most common lens still is just the basic monofocal. And I'd recommend that for patients, especially if you don't mind wearing glasses. Second question is if you do mind wearing glasses, well, how much do you mind them? Do you not want to wear glasses at all? Or do you not want to just wear reading glasses? If you don't mind wearing like reading glasses, but don't want to wear distance glasses, then the question is, do you have an astigmatism? If you have an astigmatism, then you might want to opt for a toric lens or maybe a LensX laser assisted surgery to treat the astigmatism. That will get your distance crystal clear. And that will still require you, unfortunately, to wear reading glasses. So for people who prioritize distance but have an astigmatism, a toric is the way to go. Now, let's say that you don't mind wearing reading glasses, but you might not have an astigmatism, then you can drop down to that basic lens and still get excellent distance results without paying anything extra. 
Now, the last two lenses are for those who don't want to wear glasses pretty much at all. So now the question is, what do you prioritize? Do you prioritize daytime environments with bright lights and do you prioritize reading? Or do you prioritize, you know, maybe distance like TV for sports and athletics and things like that? So if you don't quite know where you fit, then your doctor will kind of walk you through the lenses that are available and you can kind of figure that out. But nonetheless, the extended depth or EDOF lens is great for distance prioritization with a little bit of intermediate. So your dashboard, your countertop, your computer should be in focus, but tiny pill bottles and maybe small text in your phone, you still may need some reading glasses for that. So an EDOF lens, I'd say 75% of the time you won't need glasses. And then for the multifocal uh, clients, those are ones who really don't want to wear glasses much at all, but they do come with the drawback of some worsening glare and starbursts and visual phenomena at night. And sometimes the distance may not be quite as clear in those lenses, maybe 20, 25, 20, 30, and some and, and many are still 20, 20 for distance, but I found that the distance clarity is a little bit softer in those lenses, but usually not enough to be bothersome for, for patients. And I think that it would only be right to talk about monovision. Monovision involves monofocal lenses, which would basically be your standard lens, but one eye would be targeted for distance and one eye would be targeted for near. I also talk about that in my presbyopia video that I mentioned earlier. The problem with that is that you lose some depth perception, what we call stereopsis, because each eye is constantly out of focus and your brain does have to do a little extra leg work to kind of make that work. But I'd say four out of five patients tend to find that that's perfectly fine if they experiment with that, maybe with contact lenses or maybe with LASIK. Uh, but again, it's not for everyone. So it is certainly an option. If you're considering cataract surgery, let's say you've had LASIK and you like monovision, you can stick with that and that's perfectly fine. And that's usually uh, a pretty affordable option as well. Now, when it comes to refractive surgery in general, all these lenses can sometimes be used, but sometimes for patients who have previous LASIK, because the corneal shape can be a little abnormal in terms of its flattening and steepening in certain areas, certain types of lenses may not be appropriate for all patients. This is the responsibility of your surgeon to look at these analytics and kind of decide based on your individual anatomy, what lens is appropriate for you. These four broad categories are just kind of general buckets. There's a lot more nuance to this based on the brand, based on the spherical aberration, based on the material, based on the size, based on the haptic design. There's a lot of considerations um, that go, go far beyond the scope of this video, but I'm just mentioning it to you because you might come in and say, look, I need to get this type of lens. That's what I heard is the best. But the doctor may say, well, look, I'm sorry to say, I don't recommend that lens for X, Y, and Z reasons. For example, if you have retinal problems like epiretinal membrane, or if you had a retinal detachment, it might not make sense to pay for a multifocal lens because you might not get the full benefit of that, especially if the eye is already compromised in some way. Or let's say you had a contact lens infection. Um, then I, again, some of these multifocal lenses or expensive lenses may not be worth the added cost because it might contribute to some other issues. Or if you have an irregular shaped cornea from keratoconus, same idea. Sometimes these other factors do play a role. And again, this, these are not hard and fast rules, but, but it is a good idea to kind of have an open conversation with your doctor so that once you get your measurements and once the doctor has a chance to examine you, he or she can give you a more detailed explanation of which lens they might think is best for you. And that way you can feel comfortable about your decision. Now, as always, as I mentioned, even with perfectly performed cataract surgery, even with these expensive multifocal and EDOF lenses, the outcomes may not be perfect. You still may need a little bit of a refinement. And usually that can be done with either a lens exchange and the worst case scenario, or it could be done with a uh, refractive laser like an eczema laser, which can treat with PRK or LASIK after the fact if you miss the mark. Or if you opted for a light adjustable lens, then just a few sessions without additional surgery can be done with a UV treatment in the doctor's office. So there's a lot available now, but in general, the four categories of lenses is your basic monofocal, your toric monofocal, your extended of the focus EDOF, and your multifocal lenses. Those are the four broad categories available on the market today, but that will change constantly. Technology is constantly evolving and improving. So depending on when the time is right for your cataract surgery, there may be more options even yet available. So I hope that was helpful. I hope this gives a good overview of what to consider when you're thinking about you know, refractive cataract surgery and what your expectations might be. And if you have any questions, put them in the comment below. I thank you so much for your time. And if this you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks again.